for you guys that haven't gotten it yet, I will certainly continue to help you uh, over the breaks and stuff. And also, I lay out clearly in the slides how I went about the process of building the payload and um, debugging issues and that sort of thing. So if you're still working on yours, hopefully looking at those slides will help you figure out what's wrong as well. Okay, so let's see what we got up next on the agenda. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about some other vulnerable scenarios uh, in general. So what we've been talking about for uh, most of the class is just whenever you can copy in like an unbounded amount of data into a program, you can all usually wreak all kinds of havoc, and this is where most of your uh, vulnerabilities are coming from these days anyway, but for overflows, they've been around for a long time, and they will continue to be around for a long time, it's just the way it is. Uh, but we're going to talk about some other sort of variants of buffer overflows and some other vulnerable scenarios as well outside of the uh, buffer overflow arena. So, okay. Here's a um, kind of a funny one that has lived kind of a short life, but um, was the source of a lot of vulnerabilities, like, I don't know, five eight years ago in that kind of time span. Uh, previously in classes, I had said that this bug class was kind of uh, dead. And then, like, two months ago, Linux had this big vulnerability in the SU command. That was actually a format string vulnerability, kind of of this type. So I guess they are still around somewhat. But uh, we won't talk about them too much here, They're just to introduce them to you so you're aware of them. But basically, Norm normally when you want to print a string in C, you would do printf modulo s and pass this as an argument. You know, like printf modulo s comma rp1. Whenever you just pass a user controlled string to printf like this, you can actually, believe it or not, gain arbitrary code execution because this can lead to an arbitrary uh, memory overwrite. Uh, and this was pretty surprising to people back in the day. Uh, these are still occasionally used um, in conjunction with bypassing ASLR for like information leaks and so forth. And we'll see how you sort of uh, orchestrate all that later on. So, if you look inside the labs directory, at fs.c, You can see that most of the time it works perfectly fine. If I just do like FSAAA, it's going to print that string like expected. However, just go ahead and put this in here to make it clear. I'm not simply moving. Should be that's what you should do, right? Normally, when you're going to print a string and see, you want to use like the modulo S, comma RB1. A lot of people just did this as kind of like a way to be lazy while I'm printing a string, so I'm just going to pass it like this because I know it's just a nasty string. That's bad though. And the reason is if the attacker just supplies those like control characters themselves, um, bad things start to happen. In particular, notice I supply this hexadecimal operator, uh, modulo x, modulo x, and you see all these values. What do these look like to you guys? What do you think these are? Stack, stack addresses, right? Um, whenever printf sees these operators, it like um, does something to the process address space. So whenever it sees modulo x, it's popping a value off of the stack because the way printf works is when it's called, it assumes that all of these arguments for these are pushed onto the stack. And um, so when it's actually going to use them, it just pops the next value off the stack and it automatically assumes that's the corresponding argument for the uh, operator. In this case, we don't pass it any arguments. It's not like modulo x, modulo x, modulo x, modulo x, and one, two, three, four. 
there are no arguments applied. So basically what we're doing is just popping data off the stack and probably hurting the process in some way by kind of like taking values off the stack before um, they were supposed to be taken off the stack. So that's, um, you know, really not all that exciting. I'm just popping values off the stack, which is kind of cool, but it's not like we're uh, overriding a global offset table or anything. But remember that old principle of um, if you can crash it, if you can hack it, you can crash it? Well, you can definitely hack this, so you can definitely crash it. I want you guys to um, look at the printf man page. Okay, you can do that by typing man printf. Oops, man to printf, excuse me. Uh, what was it, three? Man three printf, I'm sorry. And what you're looking for is a description of all those um, arguments you can pass it. Like you see there, you can do like uh, modulo d, other crazy stuff with modulo d. And it's telling you other operators you can pass to it. The man page is kind of screwed up on my screen because the way I had the resolution. But I want you to play with this and just try to get it to crash. So basically, I want you to try throwing different control characters at it. There's like modulo C, modulo X, modulo I, modulo D, etc. And one of those is going to be especially problematic and cause a crash. And that special control operator is going to be what is abused to get that arbitrary overwrite. And I suspect if you look at the man page, when you do stumble across which operator you're supposed to use, it should be. Um, very clear to you just based on the description of what the operator does. So go ahead and um, take a few minutes and see who can figure out how to make the, uh, the format string crash. I feel like we have a 126 uh, chance that it's not done. Okay, did anyone cause a crash? All right, so which operator did you use? All of them. Bunch. Oh, that's one approach. Um, but yeah, if you look at the documentation, you'll see um, a pretty weird operator you can pass to printf, and that's the in one which is basically writing the number of bytes that have been printed so far to a, a argument that you pass to it. So when you when you read, you know, writing a number of bytes somewhere as fast as an argument, that should have, uh, you know, got the wheels turning. And so, you know, if you're writing data somewhere, that can potentially be abused. So we come here and just do a bunch of ins. We'll get a segmentation fault because it's basically trying to write the number of bytes that are written so far, in this case like zero, um, some random address that was on the stack and just happened to be popped off as the argument for this. So in this case, when it sees the first n, it's going to pop a value off the stack, assume that's the argument for the n operator. Zero bytes have been printed so far, so it's going to write zero to, it's going to assume that address on the stack was it's a pointer and try to write zero to there. And in this case, that address is probably bogus, and we got a, a bad new reference and the process crashed. So to exploit this, if you want to um, overwrite the address of the global offset table, you basically have to, and I'm simplifying a little bit, um, put the address of the global offset table on the stack, so that'll be popped off by the in character, and then before you get to that print the number of bytes equal to your um, shellcode's address in memory, and then do the in character, and it'll pop it off the stack, and we'll write that to the global offset table. It's kind of a tricky bug to exploit. It's very annoying to exploit as well. So I'm not going to make you guys do it. I just wanted you to be aware of that and see if you could um, figure out 
which operator was a problematic one. However, most modern compilers are putting in stuff to print out to sort of uh, get rid of this problem, since n is kind of one of those characters that control characters that no one really uses anyway. So you can just kind of like disable it, and you're not going to hurt anyone. So you don't see too many of these anymore. For one, they're easy to mitigate mitigate against just by reprogramming libc to be safer about the way it handles uh, printed strings. And two, because they're pretty easy to find. When you're auditing source code, finding um, format string vulnerabilities is a lot easier than finding buffer overflows. So they are kind of like uh, rapidly hunted to extinction. Okay. Um, basically, you can just scan around for printf and sprintf statements that we're not using um, you know, the control characters and find them pretty much automatically. So when they're discovered, they started to get a hunted to extinction to extinction pretty quickly. Of course, I say that, but like I said, there was kind of a big uh, format string vulnerability in Linux just a few months ago, which was a bit shocking to everyone, because like me, they had thought that vulnerabilities, format string vulnerabilities had gone away. Okay, for the, um, just another blurb about this. You saw that if I pass it, the, uh, the X operator, it's gonna pop these values off the stack. This is occasionally used to uh, defeat something like ASLR, if you can leverage a format string vulnerability as well. Because what this does is it tells you what the values are on the stack. And if you can figure out uh, where your stack is located, then you can um, pretty much bypass ASLR. So oftentimes, these will just be used to like leak some information about the state of the program. And once you know that, you can uh, beat ASLR. And I'll talk more about, about ASLR and those things in a minute, or I guess in a few hours actually, and it'll be clearer why being able to see these addresses could potentially be a problem. In a perfect world, if you had ASLR, you would never want the program to be able to know um, where this stuff is like actually located ahead of time. So if I was writing like a, uh, an Apache web server exploit, I would connect to the server, pass in some of these modulo x characters, and I'd see all these addresses, and I'd say, okay, this is where my stack is located on the server. So now that I know that the stack is located in this range, I can uh, program the addresses more accurately in my payload, and it's more likely my exploits that work. Blah, 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 and we talked about that. There's a whole frack article written about it. If you're really curious about it, you're welcome to check that out. Uh, like I said, to get all the great assault because apparently there are still some format string vulnerabilities out there that are being exploited on our own. Um, let's see here. Here we go. This is a pretty common source of vulnerabilities in applications. Why don't you guys take a look at that for a minute and see if you can tell me what you suspect the problem is. A2I basically um, converts the first command line argument to an integer. So if you passed it like a dot slash program two, instead of uh, it would interpret that two as the actual number two instead of the two being represented in the ASCII string. Because it's represented as an ASCII string when it comes in off the command line. It stands for ASCII to integer, basically. Camera, does that have some sort of exception if you pass it? Um, yeah, I think it would just um, fail, basically. I forget what you were, I guess you'd have to, I should be sanity checking the return value on that, but uh, not too concerned about that right now. <coughs> Anyone have any guesses? So what's going on here is that we are 
First of all, allowing the user to specify the size of a buffer to allocate. This is always a source of problems in protocols. You see this a lot in like proprietary binary protocols. And, um, often leads to vulnerabilities. So that itself, that in itself is not a vulnerability, but it also often turns into one. So in this case, the user gets to specify how big a buffer is, okay? And then the program is saying, well, I'm just gonna add one to it just to like give us a little extra wiggle room, be safe, and so I can like make sure I put a null byte on there to terminate the end of the screen. However, if the user was to pass in 0x ff 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 as the size, the plus 1 would turn that into 0 because numbers do not go to infinity in this x86 architecture. They wrap back around after they reach their maximum range. So basically, we have char buff equals malloc 0, so we create a buffer of like 0 length. And then we would mem copy into this buffer of zero length a very mar large amount of user data, buffer overflow. Integer overflows or underflows. Often you, know, you might see two, like malloc user input length minus one. So if the user passed a zero and it was treated as an unsigned integer, it would go to zero x f s f s f s, which is huge when you treat it as an unsigned integer. So there we go. That sort of uh, lays out the problem more clearly for you. I just wrote a simple program to do it. Make A, the largest maximum integer possible in a 32-bit architecture. Add 1 to it, just like we did for the allocation, and then look what happens. Really big number, and 0. Numbers uh, wrap around. And yeah, you see this all the time in real software. Big source of vulnerabilities these days. Okay, here's a pretty handy one. Why don't you guys take a look at this for a second, see if you can figure out uh, what looks fishy about this. I'll tell you that MimCopy assumes that um, its third argument is an unsigned integer, since you can't then copy a, a negative number of bytes out of this Hazard a guess. Any of my remote users want to take a guess? Carrie or Butch or Debbie? Would it be greater than or equal to? No. Copying, uh, so, I'm just going to check it out. If it'll pass and get a mem copy. Yes, exactly. So if user link is negative, it's going to say negative 1 is uh, not bigger than buffer size, so we pass the overflow check. But when we pass this to memory copy, it's assuming that this value is an unsigned integer, so it's going to convert negative 1 into OXFFFFFF, which is, you know, like uh, 4 million or something huge like that. So, buffer overflow. It's also good to show you if you see something like. Um, Balance checking in a pro in a function. Sometimes this will discourage people when they're doing like a source code audit. But uh, that should not discourage you. You should look even more closely at it because if they're doing something like balance checking, number one, there's a good chance that they didn't do it sufficiently. They did it incorrectly. And number two, it tells you that the developers are already aware that there could be a problem here. And if the developers are aware there could be a problem there, it's definitely worth taking a look at. So yeah, you can see that uh, size t, that third argument, is actually an unsigned integer type. So the program tries to interpret that negative 1 as an unsigned integer, which is huge. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, going along the same line of thought is assigned uh, rules, and sometimes this leads to some vulnerabilities in um, in software. And it's mainly because the signed rules are very confusing. When I say signed rules, I mean how do you compare two different data types in C? So when you have like a an unsigned number and a signed number, and you do a comparison, uh, what rules are used to uh, do the comparison there? So they're very confusing in C, and uh, the consequences of which can lead to big time buffer overflows. So here we go. Check out some of these rules you can kind of see what I'm talking about. When you compare an integer, so a signed integer, whenever you don't see uh, a sign, it just means it's automatically signed, it can be negative. Whenever an integer is compared to an unsigned integer, it counts as an unsigned compare. So uh, negative 1 compared to um, some other unsigned integer, uh, this would be treated as actually like greater because the uh, integer would be converted to signed, and negative 1 would be huge. So that's an unsigned compare. Um, integer compared to just a constant like this. Uh, constant, I believe it's because this is um, technically like a short value. But this counts as a signed comparison. Unsigned short compared to a signed short is signed. So already we're getting kind of confused because the rules are not uniform. You can see up here that signed and unsigned was unsigned, but now unsigned and signed is signed, right? So in some circumstances, the comparison could be treated as signed or unsigned, and it's not a uniform. Um, integer and size of the buffer would return unsigned. This counts as unsigned, but I'm not expecting you to memorize all these. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you that the rules that come into that come into play in like C and C++ programming, when you're comparing two numbers that aren't exactly the same type, are very confusing, and uh, it's hard to predict what exactly they are. So a lot of times programmers burn themselves because they're comparing two not identical data types, signed to unsigned, and they don't fully understand what the consequences are. Uh, for how the data is being converted to be compared. You guys following me okay? All right, off by one vulnerability. Do you see these a fair amount too? Because it's easy to think you're being safe and then uh, kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So here we go. This is actually um, potentially be exploitable. So people start using these uh, in functions like str in copy, str in cat, they automatically think that they're safe because they're using the in, the theoretically safe version. However, these um, just using those functions does not mean you're secure. They can often lead to issues as well. So like str in cat will actually concatenate an extra null byte at the end of a string, even if you've gone past the bounds. So in this case, you could actually overwrite the least significant byte of the frame pointer with the uh, with a null byte, uh, and that's just and part of the confusing part is the libc functions. Some of them will write the null byte past the ends of the buffer, and some of them will not. So this should technically be size of buff minus one. And again, those rules about when it should be minus one and when it's okay to just have the size of buff. Um, are not consistent and they depend on which libc function you're using. So again, easy to burn yourself with that. And uh, as I was trying to show, like Keith and those guys working on the frame pointer overwrite, even if you can just write a single null pointer past the end of the buffer, it just replace that safe frame pointer, at least significant by uh, zero, zero, that can still lead to an exploitable scenario, even though that's hard to believe. That can uh, still be leveraged to gain arbitrary code execution. Not all the time, but sometimes. So there you go. I just hit the off by one and uh, fed it some data, and you can see there was a crash, segmentation fault. So whenever you see a segmentation fault, your developer you should start sweating because that means you know that there could be an underlying vulnerability. If you can hack it, you can crash it. So if there's a crash, there could be a vulnerability there.
Okay, so yeah, I was explaining this to Keith and other people working on the frame point overwrite. I'm not going to make you guys suffer through that lab because it's excruciating, but I just want you to at least realize that it is possible to exploit these sort of very minor bugs and turn them into arbitrary good execution. So the way you would exploit something like what I just showed you was, first of all, assume that you can overwrite the entire state of frame pointer. Forget about just changing the least significant byte for now. Well, justify why it's still possible with just changing the least significant byte in a second. But for now, think about how you would gain arbitrary code execution if you could only overwrite the save frame pointer and uh, not the return address, nothing else. It turns out that the save frame pointer is eventually popped back into PDP. You know, the, the frame pointer is made equal to the save frame pointer uh, later on in the program execution, right? That makes sense. <coughs> That's its whole purpose in life. Eventually, also, as part of the x86 calling uh, function calling paradigm, ESP, the stack pointer, will be set to the value of EDP. Basically, when you peel another, peel away another stack frame, that happens. ESP is set equal to EDP. I'll show you this at the assembly level as well. Once you control ESP, you control the stack pointer. And so you control whatever gets popped off the stack, since you can point ESP at wherever. And ESP is controlling what uh, comes off the stack. When you get to a return instruction, essentially what you are doing is a pop EIP. Pop the next value off the stack and put it in the EIP. So you corrupt the same frame pointer. It ends up in EDP. EDP ends up in ESP. The return instruction happens. And then, bam, you control the EIP. So what it breaks down to is if you can corrupt the least significant byte of the frame pointer such that afterwards the, that same frame pointer now points to attacker control data. So it's on the stack, it's addressed as OXPF, FF, FF, AA, and you change that last byte to 00, zero and all of a sudden the same frame pointer now points to attacker control data like some local um, attacker control stack buffer. The attacker now will eventually control uh, what gets popped off the stack and control where the return instruction is. I'll show you that in assembly in a second as well. All right, and this is what uh, some of you have been suffering through for a while. But um, I'll just sort of justify when this is exploitable a little bit more. So here we go. Uh, whenever you look at the end of an x86 function, this is generally what you see. Leave and then return. And these are really just, think of them as mnemonics for uh, other more simple x86 instructions. Like um, the leave instruction is basically, let me, let me make sure I don't get the order wrong. Yeah, so leave is basically doing move ESP EDP. So set ESP equal to EDP. All right, so we don't control EDP yet. We just control the saved EDP. We don't control the contents of the EDP register yet. Then pop EDP. So now we control EDP because we have corrupted that. And then um, return. So pop into EIP. So at this point, we control EDP. Everyone with me at that point? After this is done executing, we have overwritten that save frame pointer. And then it pops that to the EDP register, so we control the EDP register once the vulnerable function is returning. We have not gained arbitrary code execution, but we control EDP. Let's think about it this way. The leave instruction is doing this, move ESP, EDP. Nothing interesting yet. We don't control either of these. But then pop corrupted EBP. It's taking that value off the stack that we corrupted and popping it into the EBP register. So when this function returns, we control EBP. When we come back to main and main starts to uh, return, it does a leave as well, which remember does move ESP EBP, and now we control EBP. Up at that point in the program's execution, we control EDP, so we control ESP. Then the next instruction would be um, pop into EIP. Well, first it would do another pop EDP. So pop attack attacker control value in EDP. Not too interesting at this point. 
is right next is a return, which is a pop into EIP. We control the stack pointers, we control what gets popped off, and uh, then we have control of EIP, and it's pretty much game over. So to exploit the one byte overflow, what it boils down to is if, by corrupting the least significant byte of the saved frame pointer, you can make the uh, corrupted frame pointer point to attacker controlled memory, then you can exploit the process. So this was me working on exploiting the, uh, the frame pointer overwrite, and I go over it in gruesome detail how to actually pull it off for those of you that are curious. And I see that this is the same frame pointer. I throw a bunch of OX90s at it, and I can see I can overwrite that least significant byte to the same frame pointer with 90. So I know that if I can make the address OXBF, FF, F4, blank, blank, I can make these last bytes anything since I'm overwriting that byte. If I can make that point to attacker data somewhere on the stack, I'll be golden. So I want to see what is on the stack and what data I control. And I can see that um, this is all attacker controlled data. And then eventually, one of them is on the form BFFFF40C. So if I was to, if I was to send um, 0C to all this, I would overwrite the same frame pointer and make it point at attack control data, and then eventually I would gain control of the IP. So you can see this one I chose 1C is my um, attack payload, and that eventually 1C, 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 1C ends up in the EIP. So uh, that should be a clear indication there's a problem here. Um, actually turning this into an exploit that will um, run your shell code is a little bit more complicated. You have to jump through quite a few hoops to get that going. Uh, for those of you that are feeling comfortable with the material, I certainly challenge you to do that, but I'm not going to make the rest of you suffer through that process. But I do lay out pretty good detail in the slides. Um, main point being, even the smallest bug, like just being off by one and not even controlling what that uh, one byte getting written as is the, the buffer R can still lead to arbitrary code execution. There's no such thing as a small bug in this arena. You just a one byte overwrite can uh, cause a catastrophic failure of security. More off by one stuff, not too interesting. Um, yeah, this one's kind of funny. Uninitialized variable usage uh, that can sometimes lead to um, lead to arbitrary code execution. Now the C language specifies that if you use a um, uninitialized variable, its value is supposed to be random. Okay, that's what the specification says. But of course, that is. Uh, not actually the case. I'm sure if any of you have done software development, you have seen uh, vulnerabilities like this or uh, warnings like this before. And I know that when I'm working on software under a deadline and I try to compile a 10,000 line kernel project and I see the DDK saying like warning, 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 pages and pages of warnings, I'm, my eyes are just scrolling past those looking for the error line, error. <coughs> 1,000 errors with zero error. 1,000 warnings with zero errors. Perfect. My program compiles. I'm not even bother looking at those thousands of errors, but you should because some of them can lead to uh, exploitable scenarios. So uh, we're testing out that random theory. I print out all these uninitialized variables, and these are the uh, the values I get. And uh, what do these look like? Stack address, right? Yeah. Basically, whenever these are referenced, remember the reference is like EBP minus 4, EBP minus 8, EBP minus C, and so on. And uh, whatever is at those address on the stack 
it just used as the um, uses the value for the variable that hasn't been initialized. So this is basically just random pocket went off the stack. But it turns out that the attacker can often uh, control these values. So let me give you an example. Okay, so this is my stack growing down, right? We're back in stack world, not heap world. We have a function called f, and it's going to do integer a. It's going to say, actually, okay, we're not going to worry about that. So here's the stack right here. ESP grows down, some room is made for A, so A is like up here somewhere in the stack. Then F is going to call a G function. And then G sets um, integer X equals 1, 1, 2, 2. Then G returns. Well, actually, before I return, we'll say that uh, stack grows down. There's some local variables, integer x. So we have x here, and it sets it equal to 1, 1, 2, 2. Then G returns. And so the, um, The operating system or the, the compiler or the processor peel back that stack frame, reclaim that stack data by moving a stack back up. That function's done executing, so you rid of that stack frame. And then F is still running and it calls H. And then um, H uses some uninitialized value. So we'll say, can you still see this okay over there on the other side? Uh, right here. And y, we don't initialize it, but we go ahead and do print y. Okay. What would the value of y be in this circumstance, even though it's uninitialized? It would be 1122. Because what would happen is it would set up another stack frame. Another function is called. I grow down. This is just pocket lit, kind of like litter left over on the stack. The stack is lazily deleted. Nothing is actually deleted. The, uh, the limits of it just grow up and down. So now y equals 1122. So occasionally you'll see a vulnerability <coughs> where an uninitialized variable is used, and by cleverly making the right heap or uh, stack calls, the uh, attacker can cause an attacker-controlled value to end up in that uninitialized variable, and that can lead to a uh, vulnerability, like if this was used as um, a pointer or something like that. That kind of makes sense to you guys. I didn't realize very well. You just have to keep in mind that uh, you know stuff on the stack is not random. It's just like trash from other functions that have already been called and that are done calling. And the stack is lazy to, lazily deleted, so they just stay there. And then eventually, uh, if an uninitialized variable is used, the attacker might actually control the value of that uninitialized variable, and that can lead to all kinds of problems. But it's not a super common class of bugs. Just um, I'm trying to make the point that all those compiler warnings that you, you know, disregard, including myself, can also often be telling you something that uh, is bad. So that was a, an example I laid out where I'm using this uninitialized variable, uh, x up top. First time I call it, it's um, totally random, you know, just like a stack address. Then f2 is called, it says it's 
variable equal to um, whatever argument is passed in two. And notice when I call f1 again, that uninitialized variable still has the same value left over x equals two. And there's some other nasty heap bugs that you can see. A lot of weird stuff can happen on the heap, like sometimes double free uh, can lead to an exploit scenario, like when you free the same block of memory twice without having out to allocate it. And basically that just gives the attacker an opportunity to um, corrupt some, meta some metadata in a bad way that leads to arbitrary bit execution. But don't see that too much anymore these days. Uh, use after free is one that you see a lot. Um, so yeah, there's double free example. You can tell I try to do this, free the same block of memory twice in a row, you get a crash. Whenever you see a crash, you know you should uh, look into that. It could mean that arbitrary bit execution is possible. Just be aware of that. Double free can be bad as well. So it's not like a memory leak kind of scenario. Um, see how much time we got. All okay. these uh, exploitations that, um, so for malicious people that would actually want to use these exploits, all the examples here assume that you have access to the source code to see these sort of things. Yeah, right. right. So is that the context of the type of exploitation for you? Yeah, this, this is all, this is what we're talking about in this class, open source exploitation. In my Windows class, which I'm teaching in June, I talk more about the closed source world. So in Linux, you often do have uh, access to the source code, this uh, open source based community. In Windows, you often do not, because all of a sudden looking at proprietary. So instead of using an editor, looking at source code, you're using like Ida Pro and reverse engineering binaries. But, um, it's not as hard as it sounds. Sometimes looking at the binary is easier than looking at the source code because the source code can kind of throw you for a loop because it's you know kind of ugly. The assembly never lies. You know it is what it is. Whereas the code, the variables can be confusingly named and stuff like that. Okay, use after free. That is another um, another ex possibly exploitable scenario. Um, I was just considering whether or not I should try to explain the Aurora vulnerability as being a use after free one. However, um, I'd like to make sure that I get to the return to libc exploit, so I'm not going to go into that too much. But if you use something after it's been free, so for instance, let's talk about this for a second. So I have char uh, chunk equals alloc. If I do dalloc chunk and then um, in some way like uh, chunk equals a, 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 a. This can actually be exploitable. Okay, use after free is something you see in browsers a lot. The reason being when you give this back to the, um, the operating system, like what happens in a browser vulnerability is this is usually contains a bunch of C++ function pointers, okay? So this contains a lot of C++ classes that have all kinds of function pointers flying around. So I'm going to go ahead and just change this into a C++ world, so I'll say class element equals um, alloc, something like that. Instead, I'm going to call a method on uh, some element dot. Element method. 
So this is used after three. It has been um, deallocated and then used. Right. The way this is exploited in a browser vulnerability is you cause the uh, the deletion of the object um, via some HTML or JavaScript syntax, so like it's an iframe, and we just cause the underlying C++ object that represents it to be free. Then with JavaScript, you swoop in here and you allocate Let's use our typical syntax here, alloc. And what happens is the memory manager reissues you the chunk that was being used for element for this uh, JavaScript element. Okay, so your JavaScript chunk, which you can read and write to, um, was being used for element. All right. Then you set a equal to shellcode. And then when this is called, element is actually pointing at attacker controlled data. And you've overwritten all of those function pointers with shellcode. And then when this happens, bam, your shellcode executes. So that's kind of what is happening with these use after free vulnerabilities you see in uh, browsers. Obviously, I'm simplifying the process, but it gives you a basic idea of what's going on. These C objects in the browser are. Um, in all these memory chunks that the Internet Explorer uh, memory manager is handling. You cause it to delete one, but then still use it and not know that it's been deleted. While in the meantime, you use JavaScript to swoop in here, suck up that, that um, chunk of memory that was being used for the freed object, <coughs> cause it to use that again, and then it's um, using basically attacker control data as a function pointer. So. A little bit tricky to exploit, but I um, just want to give you a basic idea of other ways that heat can be abused. There's a lot of good writers online about that go into the graphic details of the award vulnerability, for instance, and uh, that'll give you a better idea of how that's all working. But um, being able to swoop in and suck up that chunk of memory with JavaScript, like I was describing, requires precision understanding of the Internet Explorer uh, heap allocator. That way you can make sure that you get that chunk of memory associated with that C++ class and its function pointers. So like I said, it's all about knowing the heap allocator and how it works. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go through a little exercise here with you guys where I show you some open source vulnerable code. And I want you to try to find the, uh, the actual bug in the software. Um, this is all kind of older publicly released vulnerabilities. These aren't anything that I found. This is all in the public domain. I'm not giving you any zero days. I scoured the internet for some um, books in the internet for, you know, examples of publicly released bugs just because I wanted you to see what these guys look like in the real world because oftentimes they're not as um, simple as what I've been showing you in our labs with like a screen copy or something like that. Oftentimes they're a lot more complicated. So in some of these examples, I'm not giving you all the code. You're going to have to make some assumptions about what the data is. That's okay. Make assumptions all day. Uh, go, go ahead with that. Just um, try to spot what you feel is fishy or what you think could be the problem. And this is the easiest one we have. Can anyone spot what the problem is here? Just the string, string, string copy. copy. Yeah, SGR copy, always bad. Stack to control the data into a fixed stack buffer, then bam, stack overflow. Um, you do not see too many of these in open source projects these days. because It's pretty easy to find something like this. You can just do a grep for STR copy. And uh, something like this would be pretty obvious, be pretty obviously a problem. So I think I had to go back to like 1999, like a 1999 vulnerability for something as uh, blatant as this. Um, the ones you see in open source these days are quite a bit more confusing and not as obvious as we will see. OK. Uh, why don't you guys think about this one for a second? Any takers? Um, 
How is size up being computed? Is it just the, the null terminator? Yeah, I mean, yeah, in this case, um, you can assume that the string is null terminated and it's a safe, like a relatively safe string. With this one, the issue is if the very last character in the buffer is a quotation mark, okay, basically the saying you can reason about what it's trying to do is trying to like uh, escape quotation marks. If the very last character in the buffer is a quotation mark, it's going to double increment i, and actually move i past the bounds of the buffer, and then write a uh, quotation mark past the bounds of the buffer, potentially over the uh, least significant bit of the safe rate pointer. And um, that could lead to arbitrary code execution. So, pretty tricky. You'll see in a lot of these um, publicly released bugs, stuff like this in open source projects that, you know, you could glance over this a thousand times and not really see what the issue is, and I'm even telling you, you know, it's, it's hard to find, and I'm even telling you, look, there's 10 lines of C here, and there's a problem with it. So, spotting bugs like this is often kind of tricky. Uh, one thing you could always, should always zero in on when you're auditing source code for a project is whenever you're kind of like manually iterating over strings and like escaping or delimiting strings, that is a pretty common source of vulnerabilities in, um, in source code. Just like manually parsing strings byte by byte, the logic is often pretty complicated there. And the corner cases can cause issues, like all five of one, like we see here. Okay, uh, in this case, I'll go ahead and tell you, in response is uh, coming in from the, the user, so this is potentially attacker control. So in this case, the attacker makes in rest very large, this multiplication will overflow. Size of uh, a character, a pointer to a character actually is what this thing is, four bytes. So if this is sufficiently large, the buffer will be unexpectedly small, and then this will result in a, uh, an overflow. Okay, um, trying to decide which ones of these I want to make you guys look at. Some of them are pretty nasty. Um, you said most of these have been patched. No, they've all been patched. Yeah, I'm not giving you guys. Uh, as much as I'd like to work with real bugs, I'm going to um, frown upon that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this one's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Take a look at this, see what you can um, see. I'll go ahead and tell you. The problem is down here in this loop. When you're auditing open source software, um, for open source or you know, code that you have um, access to because it's like a sponsored project, often helps to look at the documentation uh, to see you know, what it is the source code is actually doing. The, the loop termination yeah, nice. depending on another quote. Yeah, exactly. If there's only one quote in the string, the loop will never terminate. So it's just automatically assuming that the string um, is sane and has uh, matching quotation marks. And of course, it doesn't have to be the case. So it'll just keep on copying data until it gets that second quotation mark. Um, I don't want you guys to do that one. This isn't very good. Okay. Um, here's one. The, uh, I'll tell you the answer. Yeah. Can you put a control character on the log? Yeah. Uh, format string vulnerability at printf. Um, this should be at printf. Modulo S um, buff. <coughs> so it's a yeah, format stream vulnerability. You saw a lot of format stream vulnerabilities and logging functions like this one for whatever reason. So 
There you go. Format strings are pretty easy to spot compared to buffer overflows. Um, okay, this one's really nasty, so I'm not going to make you guys do it. Uh, it's just um, all five one basically. If both of the conditionals are true, it's going to min copy and they do this plus one thing, and it turns out that that's uh, one too short. And it can copy a uh, null byte S and downs of the buffer. That one's pretty hard to reason about, though. And we have some uh, other stuff I want to make sure we get to, so I'm not going to spend too much time harboring on that. Just, want, just trying to make sure you guys get a feel for you know, looking at a source code, it's not always very obvious what the vulnerabilities are, right? If you look at this for a while, it's pretty hard to think about. Give some better ones. Um, Yeah, okay, here we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. Linux kernel. Um, Linux kernel has lots of fun bugs in it from zero day. This one is not a zero day, of course, in general. Uh, the Linux kernel has a, a, lot of, a lot of bugs. I think mainly just because they have, um, you know, hundreds of developers working on it, and it just changes so rapidly, it's hard to keep track of everything that's going on. Any takers on this uh, here or abroad? Are no users? Should be similar to one we've already seen. Alec? Yeah. Integer overflow, right? This can potentially be an uh, overflow. So in this case, you know, you're not really sure what this is, or um, if it's attacker controlled. But um, when you're auditing source code, sometimes you just have to make uh, assumptions about this kind of stuff. Just because you can't, you don't always know what all the values are mean. So you kind of like to scan through this source code, spot potential problems, and then what you'll do is like set a breakpoint on these lines and see if there's any way that you, where these come from and if you can control them. So it's all about just being able to quickly identify potentially problematic, potentially problematic spots. Whenever you see multiplications right before allocations, um, yeah, that is often a a problem like if I'm trying to find a bug with Ida Pro or something like that, I'll often cross reference like malloc or allocations and then see if any like uh, arithmetic or multiplications happen right before them. And that's a good kind of like auto magic way to try to find vulnerabilities. Uh, this one's no good. Uh, Okay, uh, let's switch over here to the Pro FTP one. Let's take a look at this. Obviously, I'm skipping over some. You're free to look at it. I'm just trying to pick out the cream of the crop for us to look at. And we have some time to uh, get to other stuff. Notice again, it is um, you have like a loop that is parsing something. Lots of case statements. It's like parsing stuff byte by byte. Whenever you see this stuff, you should uh, try to look at it closely when you're looking for bugs. Backslash n. If you never. Um, no, in this case, um, just assume that um, the n does have to be there. Yeah, sorry, you do have to make some assumptions about this stuff, so I apologize for that. But. Um, you know, when you're auditing source code, you just have to uh, develop an intuition about what you can assume and what you cannot assume. So, territory. Also, notice that this would be like a hundred times harder if all of this uh, you didn't cut out all the irrelevant code. Like you know, in the real source file, there's like hundreds of lines of code in between all these statements. So trying to piece all this together can be very difficult.
Isn't that the uh, possible unsigned comparison with the buffering? Uh, no, but those are unsigned integers because uh, buffering that's unsigned, and then um, I guess it's not telling you explicitly what's in this structure, but you can just assume that that's size T and unsigned as well. Is it that buff len can could get decremented twice and bypass the zero value? There it is, yeah, yeah. Very good. That one's kind of hard to spot. And this one it's saying while buff length is not equal to zero, all right, keep on going, my copy stuff. But um, in this case, if the very last, if this switch statement is true, I'm like the very last uh, when buff length equals one. So we're going buff length equals yeah. So when buff length equals one, this gets decremented to zero. This gets decremented again. Buff length is now negative one, and it's got to keep on going for a long time, right? So this should really be when buff length is um, you know greater than zero. Something like that. Is that exploitable or is it just going to cause a... Oh, that was exploitable. Yeah, that was, that was definitely exploitable back in the day. I mean, that, these are all pretty old, but you know, these are still representative of what you would see today if you were looking for tiny bugs in software. Um, this one's a little bit confusing, but I want you guys to think about it some. Just um, reason about what the variables are named, okay? Think about what the variables are named. It always helps to try to um, reason about what the function is actually trying to accomplish when you're looking for these uh, types of bugs. So in this case, the uh, function is um, looks like it's combining some packets, multiple packets, like into one packet. Um, I don't want you guys to play with this one too much because it's a little bit confusing. But um, the problem here is that when they do their um, balance checking, they're only considering the length of the current packet and not the length of all the combined packets. It should be a total length that's bigger than size. Yeah, so they're trying to do balance checking, but they really just need to be um, doing the balance checking on you know the whole length of the combined packet, not just the individual packet. So it goes to show you when you see balance checking in a function, you shouldn't automatically assume it's secure. If there's balance checking, the developers are aware that there could be a problem, and you need to analyze all the corner cases pretty closely. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a feel for what uh, real vulnerabilities kind of look like in, in the wild. Um, oftentimes they're pretty hard to spot. Um, if you're trying to audit open SSH for zero days, you know, repping for string copy or something like that isn't going to do you a lot of good because I can assume, uh, assure you that millions of people have already done that. So um, in open source projects that have wide peer review, um, the vulnerabilities that you find are going to look, you know, more like this. It'd be very hard to spot. I mean, if all the code was in here and it hadn't been cropped out, it would be even harder to spot this because there would be hundreds of lines of code between all these switch statements. So it'd be hard to piece it all together from that perspective. Still, um, if you're auditing code that hasn't seen a lot of peer review, like if it's a sponsor project, or there's just you know one guy that programmed it or something like that, or it was closed source. Uh, it's possible that you will see um, instances of pretty obvious buffer overflows like these screen copies and stuff like that. But in widely peer-reviewed projects like popular open source projects, you just don't see that as much, if at all, anymore. So usually it takes the form of some type of a integer overflow, bad sign comparison, um, weird loop handling, exit conditions, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah. um, when you go, 
when you're setting up to, um, you know what, before I get started on this, why don't you guys take like a five minute break and we've been going for a while.